Um, all right. Welcome everyone um, to the six lectures, six GSAP lectures and planning series. Um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Nima Kurva, Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning at, Colum at Cornell University. Um, Nima's research focuses on international urbanization, particularly issues related to small cities and their regions, and on institutional structures for equitable planning and development at the local level. Um, she has explored various aspects of the role of public agencies and non-governmental organizations in planning and development, primarily in South Asia, but also in the U.S. Um, she, has, she also has an interest in pedagogical experiments around citizenship and sustainability planning. Um, Kudwa is the faculty lead of, Nil of the Nilgiri's Field Learning Center, a disciplinary collaborative uh, co collaboration between a group of faculty at Cornell and the Keystone Foundation in India since 2011. Um, today's lecture will focus on the Field Learning Center's Water and Waste Park project um, based in villages and small towns in the Nilgiris to both describe the work being done at the NFLC and the ways in which it shapes theorizing um, in, the, in the realms of engaged research and learning um, and small city urbanization. Um, after the lecture, we'll open the floor for questions. And with this, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you, Gayatri. You know, I'm wondering if you want to come forward. It's sort of strange to see all the empty yeah. seats, and so we can just have a conversation. I have some prepared comments, but um, we can open up and just do, yeah, just have a conversation. Might be more fun. And you can leave midway. You don't have to sit at the back. So thanks, Gayatri. Thanks for the invitation, and to the rest of the committee, who I met very briefly. Um, what I'm going to do today is, I'm going to do three things. First, I'll, you know, I'll just sort of walk you through and describe the Neil Giddies Field Learning Center. We call it the NFLC. So you know a little bit about the place and the project that has been in the making for the past eight years. Second, I want to describe this pedagogical experiment. Um, and within that, you know, there's something that we do called the Crossing Boundaries exercise that the students have dubbed the CBE. And I'm going to talk, walk you through one of those uh, to show you how it links out to both the thematic and the methodological learning that takes place at the NFLC. Um, the CBE also demonstrates how we, um, and I'm quoting here from an article we wrote, invite and structure cultural collisions that present opportunities for fundamental reflections on what constitutes valid knowledge, the fluidity of cultural norms, and the range of social and ecological inter um, interactions that structure opportunities and constraints to conservation, unquote. Um, and I must add there also to livelihoods. The program is bilingual. It is conducted in Tamil and English, and it is multivocal by which I mean we seek to integrate knowledge pluralism, interdisciplinarity, lived experience, and diversity into each interaction at the NFLC and into the ongoing research projects. Um, the projects themselves have emerged from conversations with community members. So finally, I want to take what we learned from the Water and Waste Project, which is one of several at the NFLC. I co-lead it. Um, and I want to take that project to make some observations on small city urbanization, and sort of theorizing small cities, um, and, and think about that problem space of this larger theoretical project that I've been engaged in uh, for close to 15 years. I mean, it's a bit of a tall order, and I might rush at times, but slow me down um, if you need to, and I thought it's worth a try. Okay, so um, these are sort of the seven binaries that we work against at the Neil Giri's Field Learning Center. So the NFLC, it's a deeply intentional collaborative experiment that brings together the expertise and the lived experience of four groups. This is the landing page of the website, and um, I'm just going to take pieces of it to walk you through what the project is. And so these four groups that I'm talking about are the Adivasi communities of the Nilgiris Biosphere Reserve. It's the first uh, de sort of UN declared biosphere in the world. Um, it's, you know, it includes the staff of an eco-development NGO, the Keystone Foundation. You see them on top over there. Um, and a group of faculty researchers at a US university, Cornell. And two groups of students. Cornell undergraduates from across disciplines, much like their faculty and um, 
young people from the Adivasi communities that Keystone works with. So the NFLC is based in Kotagiri. It's a small town in the Nilgiris district, uh, which Gayatri has visited, I know, and some others here in the audience, including my daughter who's sitting right there. Um, and so uh, it's a small town in the Nilgiris district in the biosphere. And the biosphere itself is part of this very large area in the green diagram there um, called the Western Ghats. It, and it's, it, it sort of goes all along the southwestern coast of India. And this is a very important region for India, not only because of its biodiversity, it's, it's mountainous and forested, but it also regulates all of India's monsoonal climate. Um, so it's extremely important. Now, in parts, the Western Ghats are highly urbanized, and you can see that if you place the two diagrams next to each other. Um, and it has a thriving economy, again, in, you know, in several parts, I mean, it changes a lot. But uh, you know, the, the economy is typically based on commercial agriculture and on mining. And in terms of agriculture, it's tea, coffee, spices, rubber, the further south you go, and it has a thriving tourist economy up and down the Ghats. So our classroom is on Keystone's campus. And this is, these are some of the cities in the Western Ghats. And our classroom is really on the Keystone campus. And so, um, which is in Kotagiri, as I mentioned before. And we roam Keystone's production centers. They have four across the biosphere, the towns and the villages in the biosphere itself, um, and, the, and the varied ecologies of the, of the biosphere. You can see that in the images there. The NFLC is anchored around a year-long commitment that students make, where they spend one semester in Ithaca or in Kotagiri, depending on which group they belong to, um, preparing to be a part of the NFLC. And then they spend 15 weeks together in Kotagiri, engaged in an integrated curriculum on sustainability that requires them, again, to spend seven weeks in the classroom and seven weeks in the field doing research in, in teams. Um, and these research projects, as I mentioned before, um, are really, um, yeah, so you see them here, the various parts of the NFLC, and here's the program. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, the projects emerge in, have emerged in conversations with community members. So it took us three years to actually put the projects together, and then we launched the part which included our students. So Keystone's Tribal Advisory Council, community members from the places where we work, Keystone staff, there are about 70 now, government officials and others who we engage with all, in, you know, all come together um, through these various projects and they all attend the presentations that the students make in Tamil at the end of the semester. So our research focuses on, and, and you know, there are these learning rhythms that take place over the semester and, and, and stuff that we you know, have learned We've learned to structure it over the years that we've been doing this. So um, I'm going to go back to that. So our research focuses on four main areas. The first is ecological conservation, and it follows projects that Keystone runs in their Satya Mangalam Center, which is now in the middle of a tiger reserve, um, a newly declared tiger reserve in India. Um, we have a whole set of projects around environmental governance, or planning, environmental planning, where we study the impacts of things like the Forest Rights Act, we try and understand how non-timber forest produce collection works and its impact on livelihoods and, you know, and why lands are left fallow and so on and so forth. Um, there is a health and nutrition sort of stream and it follows maternal and child nutrition, it follows health, traditional health systems, um, as well as community wellness more broadly. And finally, there is the urbanization stream, which, which is the piece that I'm connected to. Um, ironically, the Nilgiris is Tamil Nadu's most urbanized district after Madra Chennai, which is the main, the main center for, um, and Coimbatore, which are the two largest cities in the, in the state. Now, our focus in terms of the urbanization stream, had, there's a long-term project where we've been studying water and waste, and it's the backbone infrastructure, right, that undergirds the urban. So we look at that. Um, but like all other projects at the NFLC, we are stretched and pulled and influenced and shaped by our interactions with the other work that happens. So we've done a series of projects that look at human-wildlife interaction, particularly the presence of uh, wild bison that are leaving the forest to come into the towns. 
um, the gore. We also look a lot at health questions, health of people and environments, and how that ties in with questions of waste in particular. So now you have a sense of the NFLC, and I am how many slides behind? Huh? Not that bad. And I'm going to work, sort of move, shift gears, and talk about what I said would be the second part of the talk, which is really this, this idea of a crossing, this pedagogical experiment called the crossing boundaries exercise, right? Um, now these exercises take place most mornings during the first seven weeks of the classroom phase of the um, Kotagiri semester. At its core, the CBE, as the students call it, is designed as situated language learning. So you're learning two languages at the same time. And it's grounded in experiential knowledge of the weekly theme. So the, the entire semester is structured around weekly themes that tie back to our research projects. Um, it intentionally focuses on our bodies and ourselves and the places we inhabit. In the process, creating what we think of as cross-cultural collisions on many fronts. The teaching teams, we always work in a team. It's a Cornell faculty member, or we have faculty from Hawaii and Syracuse who are part of our group. So, but it's a US-based faculty member along with an NGO staffer. And so the teaching teams have honed in on a common structure, and that's what you see uh, laid out on that slide. Um, and, and, you know, and we, so we share a certain rhythm to the structure of the CBE. We populate it with the content that sort of emerges from our themes. And then um, you know, we link it back to both thematic and methodological issues in our week, the week that we teach. We have also learned that the conversations that are sparked during these exercises and the debriefs that follow with each group of students present some of the most important learning frontiers at the NFLC. Um, I've already talked about the teaching team. I'll tell you very briefly that the US-based faculty come from the fields of anthropo medical anthropology, natural resources, ecology, musicology, and planning. Um, OK, so there are many examples of CBEs. There's one on, you know, and like I said, we've designed, I didn't say that, but we've designed maybe over two dozen. Um, there are multiple CBEs every week. Now, I, what I'm going to do, and they typically, you know, they have this structure of five questions, a certain rhythm, there's certain things that we always do. And remember, it's about learning language. So the English speakers are learning Tamil, and Tamil speakers are learning English. What I want to do here is actually walk you through maybe this one. Counting and taking measure using the body. So it's like the third exercise we do. And the idea here um, is to start thinking about measurement and to start thinking about what it means um, to take measure. You know, so for an American student, you're just going to say, oh, yeah, we use the inch and the whatever, or you know, use a metric system. But our Adivasi students, for them, this is a culturally grounded method. And so the carpenter uses the RD, which is this measure, right? The wild hun uh, honey hunter, which are groups that we work with, the Kurumbas and the Irula, measure creepers to weave ladders using the, the mar, and you'll see that on the, on the uh, drawing up there. We buy jasmine in local markets by the mullam, which is this measure, right? And, and it goes on like that. It allows us to think about, you know, how deep do you dig to measure a grave? It allows us to talk about those questions. Um, later in the, so, so it opens up several ideas about what we use measure for and how it's grounded in daily lived life and experience. And of course, the Americans are at a real disadvantage because all they can say is inch, feet, mile. And you end there, right? Um, and it's really quite an interesting exercise. Um, it allows us to do several other things. Later in the week, we talk about um, sort of other ways of representation, and we think about how indigenous communities across the world in Australia, this is from an Aborigine map, um, or the Marshall Islands, you've seen the stick maps for ocean currents, or various communities in the US, how they map and represent their worlds. We learn about sort of the abstraction of a culturally grounded method. So we go around and we learn a method, right? We learn the survey. We go around the entire classroom or the campus saying, how much is each person's mullam? 
No two people are going to have exactly the same mullam, but then it allows us to teach the concept of survey, right, and an average, and therefore abstraction and what that means. So, um, so we can, so we're able to both methodologically talk about mapping, representation, distance. We're able to um, and, and the idea of the survey. So um, we have another exercise where we map the campus in parts, and that's the image that you see at the bottom. Um, and you're only allowed to use your body to map the entire campus. So, and you learn you know, the importance of collaboration to produce knowledge about place, because the Adivasi students, of course, they know each tree, they know each leaf, they know the, the various kinds of soils, and our students all having to learn that um, across these two, this language barrier. And then we also learn, because everybody has to collaborate to create the entire map, about sort of representational scale. Right? So through this very simple CBE that opens up the question of measure as, as grounded culturally, we are able to get to so many other questions. Um, the mapping and representation exercises extend out so that people can learn, you know, so we're doing other field trips and they learn to sort of create um, sort of other kinds of maps. Here they're making maps about the biosphere reserve. And then they learn how to actually use maps to elicit information, you sort of doing participatory action research methods. Right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with transect walks, social mapping, things like community timelines. So all of these are very fundamental methods that are used when you do participatory action research. And so all of that work in this one week is feeding into these various kinds of um, methods that, that our students do when they go out into the field. So when our students do go out into the field, which would be seven weeks from when these exercises happen, all their learning, all the learning that they're doing in the classroom and more sits behind whatever they're doing um, out in the field. And the observations that they're making that translate back into maps and things like QGIS because they also learn stuff all the way to doing that. The CBEs, therefore, in this example that I gave you, um, are a critical pedagogical tool that together operationalize the tensions and the complementarities um, evident in these seven binary relations that I laid out, that I just sort of showed you in the beginning, um, and that are fundamental and central to, how we, to what we work against and through at the NFLC. Okay, I'm going to shift gears again and talk about the project on water and waste. It's one of the four streams, the urban, the, it's one of the sort of two sets of projects within the urban stream and one of four research streams at the NFLC. So I co-lead this, as I said before. Now, if you go to the Nilgiris or if any of you have been to India, you know that there's trash everywhere. There isn't a single place, you know, even deep in the forest, there's trash. And the most common sort of trash are these tiny plastic single-use sachets and packets. And you see them all over, bright, shiny little things. Um, and so there's pan masala packages, there's shampoo sachets that, you know, promise to turn your hair into that, like, dreamy white girl who's on TV. It's, it's just very strange um, and deeply saddening. But anyway, so towns have garbage dumps, like this one. This is in Kotagiri, beautiful hill town. And there's the, if you can see, you know, just next to the tea plantations, right? We still call them plantations. Um, it's, it's, you have these big garbage dumps everywhere. Now, this is a big community concern. So when we started to have conversations in, in the Nilgiris about the kinds of projects that we wanted to focus on, garbage and trash would come up all the time. Um, so, so this project, much like all the projects in the Nilgiris, like I said, emerges from these community conversations, and it seeks to build on the expertise and sort of practical expertise that Keystone already possesses. So Keystone has done a lot of work for about 15 years when we started working with them on water, on water resources. They've mapped them, they host uh, something called the India Water Portal, which is a water portal that NGOs use. Um, they host the Nilgiris Water Portal, and they've done enormous amounts of work doing resource inventories, right? So they had all this prior work and practical expertise on water. Um, the community's concern was with garbage and trash, and I have worked, I mean, my prior work is on waste as well. And so we brought these, piece and these pieces together in the water and waste um, project. 
So Keystone's sort of, you know, understanding of water, the hydraulic territories within the Nilgiris, the hydrology of the Nilgiris, understanding water as a cultural resource, different Adivasi communities have different relationships with water, so, you know, and, and the linkage of water to both health and human rights. I mean, all of this was central to the project. Um, the other thing that they had done, which I just want to show you briefly, is, you know, so these are some of the kind of mapping things that they have. Um, they've also done restoration projects because the, ecologic, the ecology of the Nilgiris is such that the, you know, the Nilgiris, there's a lot of spring, um, seasonal springs that, that emerge in certain parts of the year. And these seasonal springs are tied very closely to certain sorts of native um, species and Shola Montane forests. And so they've been involved in smaller kind of experimental projects to do reforestation with native plants, to work the, you know, sort of the whole sort of uh, toilet rebuilding infrastructure with, with government funding, bring that together to think about both wetland and spring restoration projects. So they have that sort of experimental knowledge as well. So keeping all this in mind, Bala, who's my co-lead at Keystone, um, and I mapped a five-year project, right? And, um, and what our interest really was, was to take a rural-urban transect and this, of course, goes back to what I know of how small city urbanization sort of um, work occurs. And so the rural urban transect is a super important piece for us. And so what we really did was we drew this transect and we took Adivasi and non-Adivasi communities you know, who, um, along one particular river, the Kunu River, which is a fairly important river in the Nilgiris, in this part of the Nilgiris, and we sought to actually describe and understand the water and waste problem. I mean, the real nice linkage is that all waste flows along the water streams, right? And so, so we, we sought to do that. Um, So, so our projects focus started at the level of the household and the person. We collected information on what was working, what was not working. I can tell you all kinds of things about the way gender works, the way um, age works, in terms of how people use facilities, how they put together facilities. Um, we looked at how you know, bacterial contamination takes place, the role of wild, sort of um, livestock, wild animals like monkeys, and so on and so forth. We tracked, we continue to track health outcomes, and our students help um, quite a bit. You know, they help the community health workers doing advocacy work. So this was all sort of happening and, in, and, uh, and continues to happen you know, every year as we work our way through the projects. Now, along with looking at household and community level um, infrastructure, we also sought to understand, and I'm showing you um, drawings that were made for community presentations, right? So you'll see everything is in English and Tamil, and it's, it's drawn by folks in, in the villages and, and by our students. And so we also study waste collection mechanisms, management systems, we understand, we try and understand the role of civic and municipal bodies, and we follow the waste stream as it takes over uh, springs and rivers, right? And it contaminates water that is used by people, by wildlife, by the forests, in the ghats. Um, there is a piece to this which sort of is, is about how we would work if we continue to go downstream to Coimbatore, or the cities of the Kongunadu, which are the cities in the in the um, in the plains, or the larger cities like Chennai. But for now, we're really quite focused uh, within the Nilgiris. Now, the other thing that we've also done is we've tracked recycling networks. And this is quite important, right? And so um, this is work that I've done in other parts of the country as well. But in the Nilgiris, what's really important is that um, it operates in some ways much like the rest of India, where there is a thriving informal economy around recycling and, and um, trash as a source of livelihood. But it is, it's, it's important in that it links the Nilgiris to the plains in completely different ways than one would expect, or what even folks who live in the Nilgiris ex expect, right? Now, this is what leads me to the final part of this talk, and then I we'll open up and have a conversation. 
Um, and what I want to do here is really theorize for, for a couple of minutes small city urbanization. So why do small cities ma you know, matter to us? And I'm going to skip over this slide. Why do small cities matter? There's a simple demographic fact. Most people live there. And when I say small cities, I'm talking about cities less than 100,000 in population. The majority, the bulk of the, of the world's urban residents live in these places. In India alone, about 70% of India's urban residents live in small places. Yet, and these are places that are poorer, and I've written a lot about it, and there's a lot of writing coming out about it. They are poorer, they are less well-resourced, um, and lower capacities for planning or for any other kind of you know, economic development work um, than their metropolitan counterparts. And yet, all our theorizing is rooted in big places. And it has always, you know, it makes me so uneasy. So we've managed to shift away from all our theorizing being rooted in uh, London, Frankfurt, Munich, New York, and LA. We've moved away from that. But we have not, and then we've moved away from that, and we, now we talk Mumbai, Shanghai, and, you know, I don't know, Lagos. You can name many other very large cities, where about 20% of urban residents in the global south live. We don't talk about the Kotagiris and the Mangalores, and I can name you many, many, many other places where, like I said, everybody lives. So this is sort of my, the, the problem space, and I'm us, using David Scott's term here. You know, this is the problem space that I inhabit, and I've been inhabiting now for over a decade. So, um, and here's a map of, yeah. So look at how many smaller places there are just in southern India. Southern India is more urbanized than northern India, but look at this bit. This is Kerala, right? It, it, it's, this is a typical sort of Desakota pattern. And look at the number of cities we're talking about, right? This is Mango at the tip over there, and this is where the New Deal is. So I'm, I'm in the Western Ghats in terms of all my work, um, either in the hills or on the coast. Okay, <coughs> so my, my, you know, the larger small cities project has many facets, and I'll just mention a few here. I don't want to go into them in any detail. So I explore at some length, um, I have explored how identity markers, such as caste, indigeneity, gender, or class, remain salient, right? And they are durable. So there are durable inequalities that keep getting reproduced, regardless of the kinds of interventions one makes. And these durable inequalities shape political and economic outcomes. Um, it shapes planning, whether you're looking at planning as city maintenance or as city design or as city building. I have explored how informality in land and labor markets, in waste disposal, in other selected economic activities, um, there's a whole range of them, including floriculture, right? How, how it's deeper and more widespread in these smallest places that I look at. What I want to do here, though, in closing, is to really focus on just one issue, how small cities allow us to theorize scale, right? And if, for those of you following urban theory, you know it's a big deal. Um, because we, when we think about scale, that's when we are able to think about intervention. So for planners, I'm assuming many of you are, and for geographers, theorizing scale becomes quite central to how we think about action. So in Mangalore, I studied mobility. And I followed, like I said, various commodities, the jasmine flower production sort of including, you know, being one of them. I looked at trash, much like I do in the Nilgiris. Now, in a neighborhood-focused ethnography where people had come together to establish a waste collection and disposal uh, system, I showed how a different notion of the middle class prevailed. It was not the middle class of the big cities in urban theory. These were people closer to the idea of, if you follow uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya's work or Vinay Gidwani and Shivi's work on rooted cosmopolitans, you know, it is, it is much closer to that idea of cosmopolitanism. It's bound strongly by strictures of religion, caste, and gender, and it's more rooted in the rural sense, um, even though these rooted cosmopolitans seek a kind of modernity that allows for garbage-free streets, parks to take children to, clean water from taps. Right? So there's a very particular kind of modernity that is being sought out, imagined, 
you know, fought for. Now, these are not the cosmopolitans of urban theory that we all read so much about. Neither are they the subalterns that, that sort of southern urbanism, southern urbanist writers now um, extol, right? Or that the southern turn would like to see. This is not a subaltern urbanism of that sort. Now, putting aside the people for the moment and focusing just on the trash, what fascinates me is the ways in which the materiality of trash, like that of water, separately and written a lot about, uh, produces scale, or it produced scale in the work that I was doing. Now, unlike production and disposal, which occurs within or close to city boundaries, recycling follows a completely different logic. So in Mangalore, and I do want you to look at this diagram, so this is Mangalore City, and these are all the other cities that are around it in this region, right? So all the pet bodies from this entire region all go to this one town, Karka, where someone who's very high caste, and this is highly unusual, right, has set up a very mechanized, swank new facility to recycle these pet bottles and to create plastic pellets. Um, these reprocessed plastic pellets that are being produced in Karkal go all the way to Delhi. That's how good quality they are. Mangalore is a rich town. The buses, the public buses that run in Mangalore, because it's a very well-established region. So between Mangalore and Udupi alone, for example, there'd be up to about 50 buses a day. And they're swank new Volvo buses, right? We're not talking about the old buses that clatter around on, in northern India. So these swank buses are sold seven years to the dot to Bihar, Jharkhand, the poorer regions in India. And there is an entire economy of recycling and repurposing that works across the country. And that's the networks that Mangalore is, um, and Dakshin Kannada, this region, and Udpi are all sort of hooked into. Similar systems operate in the Nilgiris as well. And so these are the little towns that we're talking about. There's Kotagiri, Kunur, um, Pindur, there's Uti over here. So your home would be somewhere here, right? Yeah. OK. Um, so in the Nilgiris, you see, OK, that little diagram isn't there. Oh, it's not there. Um, I'm ending. I'm ending soon. OK. So in the Nilgiris, and you might have seen sort of uh, you know, images elsewhere in the talk. You know, a first order recycler is often a chap on a bicycle or a moped or a little motorbike, and he's got loads of things tied all over to his, to his vehicle, and he's going from village to village, hamlet to hamlet, collecting things, buying things. These first order recyclers make their way once in two months, once in three months, into the forest, into the villages that are in the forest as well. Right? So there's a very active economy of recycling. Um, there are cell phone arranged truck pickups and routes all along the Nilgiris where these first order recyclers bundle and leave things at appointed places that the trucks then pick up. Um, there are second order recyclers or bundlers in, in the various towns as well. And all the stuff that is bundled goes down to a place called Metropolium, which is in the foothills of the Nilgiris. And from there, depending on what um, what kind of plastic or paper or metal we're talking about, it will go to various other towns which are, you know, here's Metropolium, which will go to various other towns which are in the, um, in the Kongunadu belt, so Erode, Salem, and so on. Now, what's really interesting is that these territories of recycling operate at different scales, and these are regional scales, right? Very different from how we think about the city and how we think about how we, you know, how you plan for a city. They're not bounded in the same kinds of ways. Um, in large cities like Mumbai and Delhi, people like, you know, again, Gidwani, who studied waste in detail, notes that most of these networks are located within city boundaries. So it allows cities to think about waste and recycling in completely different ways. So scale and related to it action, planning, Right? is thus shaped by the analytical unit one is looking at. Are we talking water? Are we talking floriculture? Are we talking cardboard recycling? And so on, trash. Um, it is shaped, and this seems kind of self-evident, but something we don't think about enough. It is shaped by the size of the place where a particular process takes place, 
But I think what's not self-evident, and I've given you some stories, some hints, not very much, we can talk about it more, but what is much less self-evident is the ways in which scale um, is sort of is, is, is shaped, all our actions are shaped by networks of relations amongst all the people who actually operate within that particular um, economic activity. Right? And then the, and that there are temporalities that are particular to place and region that again structure and shape these relationships. So I'm going to end here and what I wanted to sort of you know go back to was I started to talk about uh, to describe a collaborative project, right? The NFLC. It works across several binaries and boundaries as I pointed out. I produced particular you know pedagogical instruments and I used one, the crossing boundaries exercises to really talk about the kinds of work uh, we do within the classroom sort of writ large, right? And, and it allowed me to also sort of present to you particular ways in which the research strategies began to emerge. Um, what it has sort of allowed me to do, which was the last part of the talk, was it's allowed me to sort of feel my way, um, you know, through this profound unease I have with urban theory. And urban theory informs all planning. And so it's, I, I remain deeply uneasy and uncomfortable about the way we do urban theorizing. And it's allowed me to find a language um, through engagement. So the NFLC project, the project that I do on small city urbanization, will always remain unfinished, much like the cities and environments that it seeks to understand. Um, I also know that it will always involve invention. We're constantly talking about how we you know, create new mechanisms, modes, tools, we borrow, we invent, we reinvent, we change, and there are multiple small experiments ongoing in data collection, in storytelling, and in exploration. So with that thought, I'm going to end and just open up. Hopefully, we can have a conversation about your concerns and mine. So thank you.